Trade Increases Inequality by Eric Schechter In both the USA and the world, economic inequality has become enormous, far greater than most people believe it to be, and that in turn is far greater than they believe it should be. Here are a couple of statistics. The world's six richest men have more wealth than the poorest half of the people in the world. That's from EcoWatch in 2017. And the combined wealth of the world's richest 1% is more than twice the combined wealth of the poorest 88%. That's from Oxfam in 2020. This great inequality has terrible consequences that I'll talk about later. But what causes the inequality? Here is an explanation in just two sentences. If we don't share, then we must trade. For labor, money, food, rent, interest, everything. And trade, even when honest, increases inequality by giving greater profit to whichever trader was already in the stronger bargaining position. We'll look at those two sentences in more detail. A simple diagram will help in the explanation. By trade, I mean any voluntary exchange. Here are six different kinds of trade. A sale exchanges money for goods or services. Barter exchanges some goods or services for other goods or services. Rent is money traded for temporary use of space or equipment. Employment exchanges money for labor. A loan is money now for more money later. And lobbying, or bribery, trades anything for influence. All those trades increase inequality by essentially the same principles, though with different labels. The labels are simplest to explain in the case of a sale, so we'll look at that kind of trade in detail. Our seller and buyer have picked out an item of interest, for instance a particular car, and they are negotiating the purchase price. We'll look at that negotiation. Not all prices are negotiable. Here in the USA, when you walk into a grocery store to buy apples and oranges, there is no negotiation. But really you are doing a sort of negotiation in choosing which store to walk into and in choosing whether to buy apples, oranges, both, or neither. Ultimately, that choosing is just a more complicated version of the haggling for a car. It's based on the same economic principles, and it has the same long-term results. Those principles and results are more obvious in the case of the car, so let's focus on that. The buyer wants the car for whatever reason. Perhaps she needs a car for work, or perhaps she simply likes cars. But her money is limited. So even before the negotiations begin, she has already decided on some maximum price that she's willing to spend on this car. That's the blue line in the diagram. That's what the car is worth to her. She probably doesn't reveal how much that is, because she hopes to get the car at a lower price. That's the orange line. Then she's paying less than the car is worth to her, so she's coming out ahead. The difference is her profit. That's the red line. And what about the seller? She has to cover her costs. So there is some minimum price that she is willing to accept for the car. That's what it is worth to her. That's the green line. She won't say how much that is, because she hopes to get more than that. That is, she hopes to get more for the car than it is worth to her. The difference would be her profit. That's how she makes her living. If the buyer doesn't have enough money, where if the seller is asking for too much money, then the sale doesn't happen. A sale can only happen if the car is worth more to the buyer than to the seller, that is, if the blue line is higher than the green line. Then the purchase price, the orange line, can be anything between those two extremes, in which case each trader makes some profit. At this point, the capitalist jumps into the discussion and says, See? A voluntary sale happens when both traders profit. Isn't free trade wonderful? It's mutually beneficial. It makes the whole world better. That's the essence of freedom. But the capitalist is mistaken. Free trade is not wonderful, for reasons that will soon be made clear. 
Now we introduce a third red line at the right end of the diagram. It's the distance between the two extreme price levels. It's a constant in the sense that it doesn't change if we move the orange line up or down. But look, that third red line is the total profit, the sum of the buyer's and seller's profits. When the two traders negotiate the purchase price, they are agreeing on how to divide the total profit. That division process is not mutually beneficial. One trader's profit decreases if the other's increases. Can it ever happen that the two traders profit equally? Yes, if the purchase price is exactly halfway between the maximum and minimum prices. But that rarely happens, for a couple of reasons. First, each trader wants to maximize her own profit, so she's not likely to reveal her chosen extreme value to the other trader. And second, generally the traders are not in equally strong bargaining positions. Let's look at that. One trader, maybe the buyer, maybe the seller, might be in a poor bargaining position. Her rent is due, her child is sick, her refrigerator is empty, her bank account is overdrawn, and she has no one else to trade with. She needs this deal desperately. She'll accept this deal even if it brings her very little profit, perhaps just barely enough to survive for another day. That's the fate of migrant farm workers selling their labor, for instance. It's not wonderful. The other trader might be in a very strong bargaining position. She has money in the bank, food in the freezer, lots of trading partners, and her house and car are all paid off. She's in no hurry about this deal. She can afford to wait for a better deal. She'll go through with this deal only if it brings her a very big profit. So, the trader who is already in the stronger bargaining position gets the bigger profit. That makes her bargaining position for future deals even stronger. Thus, inequality increases. Of course, the increase may be small, and there may be exceptions, but the overall trend is that inequality increases. As I write this, the newspapers are full of stories about the K-shaped recovery, the rich getting richer while the poor get poorer. A little inequality becomes a lot. It has become enormous in our society. And that has terrible consequences. Here's a link to a website explaining how inequality causes poverty, homelessness, hunger, fear, hate, plutocracy, corruption, racism, wars, ecocide, global warming. And global warming is speeding up and may kill us all quite soon. Some crop failures have already begun. To survive and to make a better life, we need to give up trade, give up private property, and figure out how to share everything. You don't need to share your toothbrush or your house but we need to share the ability to get a toothbrush and a house. Is that possible? It's hard for us to imagine such a world. Private property is deeply embedded in our culture. We've been ruled by it for 10,000 years. But for 200,000 years before that, we were hunter-gatherers, sharing everything as equals. And genetically, that's still who we are. So yes, it may be possible. It's important to tell everyone about this. The transcript for this video is at leftymathprof.wordpress.com slash trade.